Well, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. I want to ask you, if you would, to go ahead and uh, take out your Bible, if you have it with you, and find the 23rd Psalm. And then also, inside your worship bulletin, you'll find our message notes for the day. And uh, I want to encourage you to follow along on that. Now, today is a, a special day. Uh, today is Senior Day or Graduate Recognition Day. And uh, that means that uh, we've got a whole bunch of uh, guys and ladies who, are, who have or are about to graduate from high school. And so we're very proud of them and excited for them and, uh, as they get started uh, as an adult. And so today we're going to recognize them. Now we're going to do that at the beginning of, this, of the second service, okay? We're going to do that at 11 o'clock. And so if you're a senior here, if you're a graduate here, uh, or family, or whatever the case may be, we want to encourage you to just to stay, and uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be excited to recognize you in the first service. And then church family, you guys are also welcome to stay. We'd love for you to do that. You can uh, watch as we recognize the seniors, and then you can slip out whenever we begin our worship time. Now, uh, this week I did something that I have never done before. Okay, and I don't. I can't promise you I will ever do it again. The thing that I did this week that I've never done before is I took a sermon request. Okay, I took a sermon request uh, about six years ago. I did a message for Senior Recognition Day that featured a list called the top ten things you didn't learn in school. Anybody ever heard that list or anything like it? Some of you are nodding your head. Well, over the past couple of years, one of our church members, Chris DeBolt, has been asking me about using that list again, especially as uh, he's got a son who's about to graduate from high school. Is that right, Chris? did last night. So Chris has been, uh, theologically speaking, he has been Im trying to impress upon me the importance of, of this message. Uh, just generally speaking, he's just been bugging me. All right, just, just month after month, year after year to do this. Well, so here, here's the deal. Again, I've never, I've never done that before. I've never agreed to, to a message request, but Chris finally talked me into it. And I, I don't want you to worry this morning, all right? This is not going to be some reheated Message. All right, I'm not going to pop it in a sermon microwave and give it 30 seconds and and bring it back out. I started from scratch with the the list this week, and and then also I realized that the majority of you here are not graduates. You're not high school uh, seniors. You're not uh, about to go to college or about to finish college. I recognize that, but I don't want you to let that be an excuse to tune me out, okay? I, I don't want you to close your ears. I want you to open your ears because we're going to be talking this morning about some principles that apply to every single one of us, no matter who we are, no matter what stage or season of life we're in. And I guarantee you that there's something God would like to show you specifically today. So let me just ask, are you guys willing? Are you able? Are you capable? of staying with me despite the fact that, that maybe this message wouldn't seem to be directed specifically to you. I need a, a, a yes or a no. Can you do it? All right, good. I see mostly yeses, a few noes. I'll write their names down and we'll deal with that later. Now, when, uh, when it comes to this list, there's actually some question about who came up with it. I, uh, I heard this list first from Paul Harvey. You guys remember Paul Harvey, radio commentator? Uh, but I've also heard that it was attributed to billionaire Bill Gates. Regardless of who wrote it, I think most of us are going to agree, it's a very practical and sobering list. And I think what you'll also find is that there are some strong biblical principles here as well. And so what I'm going to do this morning is read through this list of 10 things you didn't learn in school but should have. And at the same time, I'm going to parallel it with the most, one of the most familiar passages in Scripture, the 23rd Psalm. Then I'm going to give you the, the biblical principle as well that goes along with it, okay? Right, are you ready? Are you ready? To, can we jump in on this? All right, let's do it. Here we go. Number 10, the top 10 things you did not learn in school. Here it is. Number 10, flipping burgers is not beneath your dignity. Amen. See, I knew, I knew it was going to be this way. Uh, flipping burgers is not beneath your dignity. Your grandparents had a different word for burger flipping. They called it opportunity. Isn't this going to be fun, graduates? Huh? 
It's going to be an exciting morning. Let me read it again. Flipping burgers is not beneath your dignity. Your grandparents had a different word for flipping burgers. They called it opportunity. And then listen to the first verse of Psalm 23. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. And then the biblical principle that I want you to write down is this. I must learn to trust the shepherd's perfect provision. Will you write that word in? I've got to learn how to trust the shepherd's perfect provision in my life. And again, as I direct this towards those who are graduating, do you, can you guys look at that principle and say, okay, that no doubt that applies to me, right? I mean, I need to know that. I need to understand that I need to put my trust in the shepherd's perfect provision. And here's why. Because we live in a world that tells us that we should immediately be making the same kind of money and living at the same kind of standard that it took our parents their whole life to, to accumulate, and we expect to be able to do that right out of school. But here's the reality. You're not going to enter the job force as a vice president, and you're not going to have enough to retire on until you've earned it. And so the psalmist says, you know what? Don't put your trust in benefit packages. Don't put your trust in upward mobility. You need to put your trust in your heavenly Father. You need to trust God. That as long as your trust is in Him, you are not going to be in want. You know, I, I don't know if you've heard me say this before, but as a kid, I always read that verse, and I thought when it, when it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not uh, want, I always thought that means the Lord is my shepherd and I don't want Him. Right? The Lord is my shepherd and just back off, God. And it took me a long time to figure out that's not what that means. That it, it was like two weeks ago. It, what, it, what it means is, is that the Lord is my shepherd, and because He is my shepherd, I'm not, all my needs are going to be met. Right? Does that make sense? So as long as we trust in Him, does that mean everything's going to be perfect? No, we know that. But as long as we trust in Him, we will not be in want. Now, by the way, do you know the main reason that young people today believe they deserve such a high standard of living? Because their parents desperately want them to have it. And a lot of times, parents are more than willing to sacrifice anything they have to to ensure that their children never want for anything. Guess what, parents? That's not your job. Do you hear me? That's not your job. It is not your job to provide for your children in every possible way. It is God's job to meet their needs. So let Him do it. In the meantime, you've got to learn to trust the shepherd's perfect provision. Ten things you didn't learn before you graduate. Number nine, life is not divided into semesters. Right? You don't get summers off. And very few employers are interested in helping you find yourself. Do that on your own time. Let me read it again. Life is not divided into semesters. You don't get summers off. And very few employers are interested in helping you find yourself. Do that on your own time. And then here's the, the verse that parallels it. Verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Then the, the biblical principle here is that you need to trust the shepherd's perfect satisfaction. Will you write that word in? Trust the shepherd's perfect satisfaction. And what the psalmist is saying here is something that we've talked about here at Oakdale so many times, that nothing that happens in your life apart from God has any lasting value or significance or satisfaction. If you want to be satisfied, if you want to find happiness, don't look for it in your relationships with that perfect guy or that perfect girl. Don't look for it in, your, in that perfect job or that perfect house or that perfect degree or that perfect resume. You've got to learn to find your satisfaction in your relationship with God. And then you've got to realize that doesn't cause those other things to go away. I mean, you're still going to have a degree and a career and a home and relationships, but when you look to God for your satisfaction, those other things become even more satisfying. You guys agree with that? Have you experienced that in your life? Only God, only God can lead you beside still waters. So trust the shepherd's perfect satisfaction. Ten things you didn't learn before you graduated. Number eight, are you ready? Parents, say this with me. Life is not fair. fair. See, they already knew exactly what we're going to say. Life is not fair. Get used to it. 
Life is not fair. Get used to it. Verse 3 says, He restores my soul. The biblical principle that you need is to trust the shepherd's perfect renewal. Trust the shepherd's perfect renewal. Now, what do I mean by this? You, you might wonder what the, the life principle, life is not fair, and the biblical principle, He restores my soul. You might wonder what those two things have to do with one, with one another. Because they don't seem to have any kind of connection, right? But the truth is, they actually have everything to do with one another. You see, life is not fair. It will not always work out the way you want it to. It will not always work out the way you think it should. It will not always work out the way that you planned it to. The reality is that all of the planning, all of the preparation, all of the knowledge in the world will not keep life from being unfair. In fact, experiencing the unfairness of life is part of what helps you grow, isn't it? There was a young man who was appointed as president of a bank at the tender age of 32. And the promotion was far beyond his wildest dreams, and it was pretty scary as well. And so he did a very smart thing. He went to the older, uh, wiser chairman of the board to ask for advice on how to become a good bank president. The older man replied to him, make right decisions. And the young man thought about that for a moment. He said, well, I, I thank you very much for that. That is very helpful, but could you be a little bit more specific? How do I make right decisions? The old man answered, experience. Well, now the, the young guy was starting to get a little bit uh, upset. You know, he felt like he was being mocked. He said, well, sir, I realize that. That's why I'm here. I don't have enough experience to make right decisions. How do I get experience? Wrong decisions, said the chairman of the board. You see, if life were fair, we'd get the experience up front, wouldn't we? We'd get the experience before we made wrong decisions. But it doesn't work that way. And then when you finally get some experience under your belt and you think that, that you've got life all figured out or that job all figured out or that marriage all figured out, something changes. And you have to start all over again gaining experience. So here's the thing. When the rug gets pulled out from underneath you, when those hard times hit, where are you going to go to find your strength? Where are you going to go to find the restoration that you need in your heart and in your mind? And I'll tell you where you'll find it. You'll find it only in your relationship with God. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that life is hard, but God is good. Amen? Life is hard, but God is good. So remember, trust the shepherd's perfect renewal. Top ten things that you didn't learn before you graduated. Number seven, your school may have done away with winners and losers, but life has not. In some schools, they've abolished failing grades. They'll give you as many times as you want to get the answer right. This doesn't bear the slightest resemblance to anything in real life. Right? And then number six goes along with it. Be nice to nerds. Chances are you'll end up working for one. Right? <laughs> now, I don't say that to make fun of anybody that, that might be considered or consider themselves a nerd, but these life principles are about the choices we make. You see, the world sometimes teaches us that it doesn't matter what we do because there's no consequences in our life. I mean, so what if you make a failing grade? You were just disadvantaged. There's always a reason. There's always a justification. Feel free to, to make fun of nerds and to treat people badly. They deserve it, and you shouldn't feel bad about it. It's kind of survival of the fittest, right? But the psalmist sees it differently and says in verse 3, He guides me in paths of righteousness, listen to that last part, for His name's sake. In other words, the choices that we make do matter. The paths that we choose are important. Because number one, as Christians, we bear His name. We represent Him to the world. And number two, we've been called to live a life that is pleasing to Him. That's why we must learn to trust the, the shepherd's perfect direction. We've got to learn to trust His perfect direction. Now, I would say to, to those of you 
who are graduates or even those of you who are, are uh, students, you're going to have a lot of choices to make in the next few years. I would guess there, that there are a lot of people who are going to be here this morning who, and, and, and those who are sitting here right now who wish very badly that they could go back to the time that you're in in your life and go back and make some different decisions, right? Go back and make some different choices. In fact, let's just take a poll. How many of you would say, I wish I could go back to my senior year in high school and make some different decisions over those next few years? Anybody? Now look around, guys. Look around. Yeah, look around and recognize that, uh, how, how many of us feel that way. And the reason that so many people feel that way is that they, can, they see now how their choices impacted the rest of their life, right? We can go back and we can pinpoint it and we know that's the point at which I went this way. If I'd done something differently, I would have gone the other way. And I'd be willing to bet that the same people, the same ones who raised their hands, would, would desire for you as students to learn from their mistakes without having to make the same bad choices in your life. Isn't that true? We, we would very much love for you to be able to avoid that, but it's hard. See, here's what it comes down to. Almost every one of those regrets that people have represent a time when they weren't allowing God to guide them on paths of righteousness. Is, is that not right? Nearly every one of those regrets were the result of thinking, you know what, I can handle this on my own. Or it'll just be this one time, then I can go back to following God. How many times? How many times have we said one of those two statements in our life? Please, please, please remember, only God can give you the direction that you need. So trust the shepherd's perfect direction. Top ten things that you didn't learn in school. Number five, if you think your teacher is tough, wait until you get a boss. Exactly. If you think your teacher is tough... Wait until... Now, it's funny. There's adults giggling. <clears throat> None of the students seem very pleased at the moment. That's all right. You're going to have great lunch conversation today, okay? Uh, if you think your teacher is tough, wait till you get a boss. Here's verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, <laughs> I fear no evil, for you are with me. And, and here's the point. It's not that you need to you know, walk through the valley of death because your boss is so bad or you know, that fear no evil because they treat you so badly. It's not that. It, the point here is that life is about to get a whole lot more complicated. Right, adults? I mean, from this point forward, it's just going to be exponentially complicated. I distinctly remember being a college junior or senior and thinking that if I could just graduate, if I could just walk across that stage and hold that diploma in my hand, I would finally be in control of my life. Amen? That's all I wanted. I, I wanted it so bad. No one, no one could tell me what to do. No one was going to tell me where to go, how to act, or what to be. Except, of course, for my wife, my bank, the credit card company, my boss, my in-laws, the mortgage company, the IRS, and the government. And those are just a few, right? And, and, and here's what we learn. As life gets more and more complicated, it gets harder and harder to control. The less control we have, the less protection we feel against hard times. That's why you've got to learn to trust the shepherd's perfect protection. You've got to learn to trust God's perfect protection in our life. Now I want to read a couple of verses to you. They're just short, so you don't have to turn and find them, but from Psalms, Proverbs, 2 Thessalonians, and Romans. Here's Psalm 1830. As for God, His way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all who take refuge in Him. Here's Proverbs 810. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Here's 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. But the Lord is faithful, and He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. And then here's Romans 8.28, the go-to verse for hard times in our life. Okay, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Now, let's, just, let's pause for a second. I want you to think about that verse. Does that verse say that all things are good? Yes or no? Does this say all things are good? 
No, not all things are good. There are some bad things in this world that, that, you know, that we can get ourselves into. There are bad things that other people can do to us. There are bad things that, help, that happen that we have no control over. So God does not say everything's good and great and you're never going to struggle and you're never going to have a hard time. He never says that. He says, I'm going to take every experience you have, all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it, and because I love you, I'm going to work it out for the best for you. Well, guess what? There's no one and there's nothing in this world that can make that promise to you except for Him. That's why you've got to learn to trust the shepherd's perfect protection. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. The top ten things you did not learn in school but should have. Number four. I'm going to give you two at a time here. Number four. Television is not real life. All right? Television is not real life. In real life, people actually have to leave the coffee shop and go get jobs, right? And then number three goes with it. The world doesn't care about your self-esteem. The world will expect you to accomplish something before you feel good about yourself, right? Here's Psalm 23, verse 4. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, this principle seems to be about protection, right? Your rod and your staff. But actually, it's about correction. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, that, it kind of sounds like a, a nice thought, right? Think about it. Can you sort of picture a friendly, smiling shepherd out in the meadow, rolling in the grass with the little white lambs, right? Loving on them and watching over them. Let me ask you a question. What do you think a shepherd's rod and staff are for? At home, we have a, a little ping pong paddle that sits up in the, in the cupboard. And, I, and I'll be honest, it's been a while since that thing has come out. But in the days, and it's still there, just in case I need it, okay? But in the days where it came out early and often, let me ask you a question as you think about that. Do you think that when that came out of the cabinet, that means things were going right or that things were going wrong? It, it meant that it was time for some correction, right? And by the way, I discipline my children because I love them. If I didn't love them, I wouldn't really care what they did. I just let them do whatever they wanted to, go wherever they want to go. But because I love them and I love them very much, I know that they have got to have boundaries that protect them and keep them safe. Uh, and, and so I know that sometimes that means they've got to be disciplined. Well, guess what? The same is true of the shepherd's rod and the shepherd's staff. And the same is true of God's correction in your life and in my life. Now, what's all of that mean? Here it is. Here, it means you've got to learn to trust the shepherd's perfect correction. You've got to learn to trust the shepherd's perfect correction. And I realize that's not most people's favorite attribute of God, right? The fact that, that he's going to discipline us. I realize nobody wants to be corrected. Probably nobody wants to be disciplined. But that doesn't change the fact that we need it. He corrects us because he loves us. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't care what we did. All right? Ten things that you didn't learn in school. We've got two left. Number two. If you mess up, it's not your parents' fault. So don't whine about your mistakes. Learn from them. Let me read it again. If you mess up, it's not your parents' fault. So don't whine about your mistakes. Learn from them. And here's what Psalm 23, 5 says. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Now, there are a lot of things that you're going to face in the future. Some of them you can prepare for. Others you can't. Some things that are going to happen in your life are, are avoidable, and some things aren't. The world teaches us that when we mess up, it is okay just to find somebody else to put the blame on, right? And you've heard me say before, we live in a generation of world-class justifiers. And I'm talking about all of us. We are really, really good at it. It is never our fault. There is always somebody who's close by who can take the blame for us. 
But what the Bible says to do instead of placing the blame on other people is to learn to trust the shepherd's perfect preparation. Learn to trust his perfect preparation. I want you to think about what the psalmist is, is saying here. He, he says that God prepares a table that will nourish us and prepare us. And, and when will He do that? Before we face our enemies. It also said that God anoints our head with oil. Now, I don't know if you know this, but when someone would be anointed with oil in the Old Testament, that was to signify a, sort of an ordination. An ordination which said, you are set apart. Okay, We anoint with oil, you are God's chosen in, in some form or fashion. And so God anoints our head with oil to signify that we are His before we go into battle. In other words, when we carry that banner into battle, whose banner do we carry? We carry His. It's not ours. It's not anybody else's. He anoints our head. He sets us apart. He prepares us. And He sends us in carrying His flag. And, and you know, here's the deal. We don't have to worry about going into battle shorthanded or undersupplied because our cups overflow in Him. See, one of the other big regrets for most adults is that there have been so many times in our life when we didn't seek God's direction or protection or provision until after things got bad. Am I right or am I wrong, adults? You know it's true. So many times, yeah, we've trusted in God after the fact. We trusted in Him after the point of no return. We've trusted Him after we crossed the line. And, and then we said, okay, oh God, you know, I, I want to invite you in. I, I want you to come and help me now because I'm in such you know, trouble. We knew better. We knew better than to do that, but we didn't think to include God in our decision-making process until after it was too late. So let me challenge you, especially you, you students. Listen, please don't do that. As you prepare to go off to college, as you prepare to start a career, I'm begging you, stay connected to your church. Okay, if you go off to college and, and you're, you're living away from home, find a church there and get connected to that church. If you're going to stay home, we, we, we'd love to have you here at Oakdale. But you know what? Maybe you find a, another church that you feel is a fit for you where you can serve and grow. And I would encourage you, way more than, than I want you to be here, I want you to be a part of God's body. Does that make sense? It's so important that you're connected not only to God, but to His family. You've got to make yourself accountable to other Christians. You've got to make sure you're spending time with God every day. You've got to make sure you continue to grow in your relationship with Him. So you've got to learn to trust the shepherd's perfect preparation. Ten things that you didn't learn in school. Here's number one. You ready? Goodness and love will, will follow you all the days of your life, and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But... You're not welcome to stay at your parents' place for nearly that long. Okay? And here's the point. You may find the safety and the security of your parents' home and your old bedroom and your old you know, baseball curtains, right? Or your old Barbie curtains, whatever it is. You may find that hard to leave behind because it's a pretty good life. I'll never forget... Uh, going off to college, Christine and I went to school in South, uh, at Southwestern in, in Weatherford, and, and we lived there, and, but we would come home on the weekends. And I, I remember after you know, being gone for I don't know how long, but for a while, and the first time I came back and, and we parked the car in front of my parents' house, and I got out of the car and I was like, what, what is that? I smell something so good. And we walked towards the front door and I could smell my favorite, one of my favorite things cooking. And there was a fire, you know, going in the fireplace. And, and I, looked, you know, I looked around at just the outside of the house and I thought to myself, why was I in such a hurry to get out of here? Right? You go inside and there's people who love you and care for you and they, they wash your laundry and... You go over to the refrigerator and you open up and it's a miracle. There's actually stuff in it, right? <laughs> you, uh, you sleep in a nice, comf comfortable, soft bed that's you know, three times the size of your stupid dorm room bed and, and, and there's no spring sticking up in your back. And, and, and when you get up in the morning, you know, someone comes and, and makes the bed you know, and it's all nice. And, 
And, and it may be really hard to walk away from that, right? Because you know that's not how it's going to be. You do know that's not how it's going to be, right? Once you, get to, once you get to college. Or it could be the opposite. It may be that you can't wait for the moment when you can finally say goodbye to your family, right? I mean, hasta la vista, I'm out of here. Uh, you know, don't forget to write. And I, I get that. I understand that. Everybody's a little bit different when they, when they think about leaving. But one way or the other, just remember, it's God who brought you this far. And it is God who will get you to where you're going. So you've got to learn to trust the shepherd's perfect completion. See, here's the deal. Your parents, they love you. Your parents love you. That's why they put up with you for all these years. All right? When you were born, God gave them the responsibility of taking care of you. But the reality is, you don't belong to your parents. Did you know that? You don't belong to your parents. You never did. They were only stewards. You know who you belong to? You belong to your Heavenly Father. It's God that you belong to. He's the one who knew you before you were even born. He's the one who shaped you, shaped your mind, shaped your heart, shaped your personality in, in that specific way that makes you, you. Okay? And, and yes, your parents love you. And yes, they have tried their best to guide and protect and to provide for you. But you've got to understand this. Their ability to guide and protect and provide for you is nothing compared to God's ability to guide and protect and provide for you. And besides that, your parents, they're not necessarily going to be there every moment of the day. They're not going to be there, maybe, on a daily basis. But do you understand God's not just going to be there daily? God is going to be wherever you are, right? God is going to guide and protect and provide for you every day, no matter where you are. Not only that, He's not done with you. You realize that? You know, I, having a teenager of my own, I realize that, uh, some, that a lot of teenagers sort of have this misconception that they've already, you know, they've arrived, right? They've, got, they've, they've already got all the knowledge they need, all the experience they need. They've pretty much got life figured out. And I just want to encourage you, as smart and as handsome and as sharp as you are, God's not done with you yet. I know it's going to get even better. Isn't that great? Okay, it's going to get better because God's not through with you. The Bible says that he who began a good work in you, you remember the rest of that? Will be faithful to complete it. Now the only question that remains is will you continue to be faithful to Him? And I'm telling you, your relationship with God is the single most important resource that you have as you walk away from your graduation, as you walk towards your last year in, in high school. No matter who you are or what, where you are in your life, you've got to be true to that relationship. And you can be sure that love and goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. I want you to know, I have a lot of faith in you. I have a lot of faith in every one of you in this room this morning. I believe that you are going to do great things in your lifetime. I believe that you will become the godly men and godly women who are going to change the world around you. I believe that. But as much faith as I have in you, I have even more faith in our Heavenly Father. So I want to, I want to ask, as, as you prepare for this next chapter of your life, as you prepare, adult, for the next season of your life, here's what I would challenge you to do. Submit to Him. Submit to Him. Give Him first place in your life, above everything else. And remember, when you put Him above everything else, that doesn't bring everything else down. It lifts everything else up. So surrender to Him. Submit yourself to Him. Give Him priority in your life and know that He will be with you every single step of the way. Can I ask you to bow your heads as we prepare our hearts this morning just seeking to hear from God and seeking to respond to Him? I want you to think about that 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in want. I want you to think about the provision and the protection and the correction and the guidance all those things that God offers to us.
You know, it's possible, even though we're sitting in church this morning, right now could be the first time you've actually thought about God today. Why don't you just embrace Him right now spiritually? Can you just talk to Him about the 23rd Psalm? God, thank you for being my shepherd. God, thank you for providing me with all the things that I need. The fact that my cup overflows, I've got more than I could ever use. Still you bless me. God, I realize that sometimes I mess up and you have to correct me. I don't like it. I'm not looking forward to it, but I know you have to. And I know you do it because you love me. God, most of all, thank you that I can count on your presence in my life every single day, forever and ever and ever. And that ought to change the way we approach our life. Father, I lift up these seniors, these high school guys and girls getting ready to go off and start their life. I pray that they would know your presence and they would continue to cultivate their relationship with you. God, bring us back. Bring us back to what really, really matters in our life, and that's you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.